Hello, everybody. It's C.B. Bowman. And you know, I keep it real. So I have to adjust my camera here because we're a little bit on an angle. There we go. That's much better. I'm so happy to see you guys today. And we have a guest that's a little bit offbeat for us. But you know, C.B. likes to take it offbeat. So as we go into Courage to Leap and Lead, I have a guest who's an expert in systems thinking. That's a mouthful in itself, right? And mapping and all those insane things that we hear about in the upper echelon of the academic world. <laughs> and I have this um, uh, desire to know all about these weird things. And I hope you'll go on the journey with me because I believe that this whole philosophy, all these areas really do relate to increasing our ability to be courageous. So the courageous is not this big elephant in the room, but small bites of things. You know that expression, how do you eat an elephant? It's bite by bite. That's right. So let's look at courage as a bite by bite to get us to go. So with that today, at Courage to Leap and Lead, we have Derek to talk to us about it. Derek, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And so I would love to know about you as a young kid. How do you get involved in such high-level thinking work? Uh, uh, well, uh, it... It was a bit of a what I might what you might think of as kind of a Forrest Gumpian uh, trajectory. Uh, it wasn't very straight line. I I was a I was born to a Colombian father and a, a Scottish Bostonian mother, uh, and grew up in a kind of Latino household. And um, no wonder why you're so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was definitely a place of deep learning. My father was raised by Jesuits in Colombia, so the, the Jesuits, you know, are all about learning, and our house was about learning. But for whatever reason, I I struggled mightily in school, um, so I had real trouble in school. Later, I'd find out that I had things that I didn't even know existed, and today are very popular, like ADHD and. Uh, smaller forms of autism and things like that but um well can we talk I'm highly dyslexic and <laughs> okay. I didn't find that out until I was in grad school right yeah it took me until uh, pretty close to my 30s to understand uh that that I had th some of these things and um then I was able to do something about it but uh, until I understood myself it was very hard so I struggled with school uh really things you have I'm sorry. Tell us which of these things you have. Well, I'm uh, I'm ADD and and a little, a little you know the, there's a spectrum of autism, so there's a lot of different uh, sort of you can be in a lot of places and uh, have a little bit uh, on on the spectrum uh, and get very hyper focused, uh, but also have not so much control over what I focus on. So. A lot of people think attention deficit means that you have a deficit of attention, which is actually a, a bad name for it. Uh, it actually means that you don't have total control over where your attention goes, but ADHD people um, actually have a thing called hyper focus where they can focus almost to their own detriment sometimes on things. And, um, and so, you know, once you learn that about yourself, then you can kind of work with it. But uh, I, at the time, I didn't know, you know, any of these things existed. I don't think my parents knew that they existed. So um took a while to figure it out. You know, it's so true because um, when I grew up, I, of course, they didn't really know about dyslexia. And um, I suffered terribly in school, terribly. And I'd always get punished by my parents but for not succeeding in a class or whatever reason and i i just grew to hate school right yeah. and it wasn't until i was in graduate school that i found out i was dyslexic wow and it was purely by accident yeah, i was taking a course on account in, in accounting 
because I figured I would get the difficult math things out of the way. Oh, yeah. And I had a tutor. I hired my own tutor because I thought I'm never going to be able to get through this, right? And she was giving me a test. And she, and one question I got wrong, and she said to me, how come you got this question wrong? We just went over this and you got it right. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, this question here. And I said to her, I've never saw that question. And then she started really paying attention as she was tutoring me. And she said, CB, I believe that you're dyslexic, which is why oh, wow. back when you never saw that question. Yeah. And just at that time, there was an episode of a television show, Bill Cosby, where he talks about his son being dyslexic. And so I said to her, well, where can I go for help? And she said, well, you can go to the Orton Institute. And I went and I said, I don't want to be with all these people that are complaining about <laughs> this and that. So I'm just going to fix this myself. That's right. <laughs> but fixing it actually meant admitting to it and then figuring out ways to get through it. So yeah. I'm completely in your camp. I get it. Totally. Birds of a feather. Yes. Well, and ironically, that uh, that admitting to it, that self-awareness, and also the sort of uh, then then working to to fix it is is part of it's sort of part and parcel of both systems thinking and and courage. Um, it, yeah. That's part of the process. Exactly. And in fact, um, when I started my association, I had a colleague who would constantly send me emails, you spoke, spelt this wrong. This doesn't look <laughs> good for the association. And of course it would be after it was already released. So right. finally I had the courage to say, you're not helping. <laughs> if you want to help, then you edit everything I send out before. And I need it within five minutes. Wow. Um, and uh, otherwise silence, because well, I can't withdraw it, right? This yeah. is not an internal system in a company. And then I said, you know what? I'm just gonna put a disclaimer on my email. And so now I have this whole disclaimer on my emails. I don't know if you saw it. It says, you know what? I'm dyslexic. There are some famous people that were dyslexic, right. like Cher, et cetera, <laughs> Einstein, you know, um, Charles Schwab. So if you have a problem with dyslexia, it's your problem. And that's what my email says. That's great. <laughs> I have a uh, a family member who actually is dyslexic and and uh, you know caused lots of problems for him growing up and things like that. And it turned out that he he would kind of reverse words. He'd yes. see them backwards. Yeah. And, um, today he's a he's a fantastic dentist. And one of the things that dentists do is you know it, it's good for a dentist to be able to sort of see things backwards because they're yes. constantly looking in mirrors. Yeah, house, you know, so he, you know, it, it, if, if you can sort of see what's going on and understand yourself and your system, um, then you can utilize it to your advantage. It doesn't have to be a disorder. And I don't think ADHD or ADD is a disorder. Um, I call it boredom intolerance disorder because it really, it really has to do with just being intolerant of boredom. Um, well, I welcome it being called a disorder because I would like to have it listed in the um, the, the manual for yeah. defining these things. Yeah. But as the therapist said to me once, we can't because it affects so many people so differently right. that we can't put it in a pigeonhole. I'm like, uh, recreate the pigeonhole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what smart ass dyslexics say. Exactly. Figure it out. It's your problem. <laughs> so I interrupted you on a fabulous story. I love this. So, so okay. So you figured that out, and yeah. So, uh, well, I, I I struggled in school. I actually, ended up dro dropping out or failing out and of high school. And um, you know, you got to find a job and things like that. And the one thing. The one skill that I had was actually mountain climbing or mountaineering. And so for 20 years, I was a mountain guide uh, and I took people up and down mountains all over the world uh, and guided people of all different 
ages and populations, uh, everything from executives to a gang intervention to drug addiction to, you know, what we call victims of wealth, people that, you know, wealthy kids, uh, poor kids, all different kinds of kids uh, and adults um, for over 20 years. Uh, so that was really where I kind of grew up and um, and was able to see people in challenging situations, challenging environments, uh, and and see their response and see group dynamics and uh, and all of that combined with all of the different systems that are in the mountains, like weather and you know geology and geography and all these different systems, started getting me thinking about well, how do you see all these things together because they're not existing separately, right? They they exist kind of together as a whole and um, didn't even know that there was this thing called systems thinking and of course never as a high school fail out I, I never imagined that I would be a, a an academic uh, at Cornell University or or anything like that so um, and then worked uh, worked with the civilian conservation corps similar thing lots of challenges lots of uh, community service and service to others um, and, and developing people uh, in, in very intensive experiential environments. Um, worked with the restorative justice movement on criminal and uh, juvenile justice projects. And then became decided that, uh, again, it's very strange, but uh, kind of heard about these things called theorists. And I didn't know what a theorist was, but um, that you could use like something as simple as mathematics to theorize something about the universe, whatever it might be, um, that, uh, and, and then maybe find out that it could be true through experiment and things like that. Well, I, I love, see, to me, this whole area of thinking has great interest to me. I, I don't know why, but, um, you know, so for example, the, the movie, A Beautiful Mind, mm -hmm. I was mesmerized by that. I yeah. mean, I couldn't think of anything else for years after seeing that movie. And so the idea of being able to control, it's probably not the right word, but it's the word I'm gonna use, where things will end by studying where they began and where they are in the middle. Um, I don't know if that system's thinking, but things like synchronicity, mm -hmm. um, a beautiful mind, those kind of things, I, I go, wow, there's something greater here. I don't know what it is, but it's fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, and, and I look at things like, how was Stonehenge actually built? <laughs> what, what's the deal with Easter Island? You know, and I was talking to an astronaut about this whole concept and he said to me oh it's all fake people designed it and built it because you know there's no other ev evidence i'm like yeah, i'd rather think that there's evidence <laughs> that we haven't discovered yet. haven't discovered yet yeah so okay so tell tell me tell us what is mapping what is systems thinking Simple yeah, so definition. Simple yeah. definition. Yeah. So systems thinking is kind of just a combination, a synthesis, a, a grouping of all the different kinds of thinking that we have. So if you think about critical thinking or creative thinking, or what sometimes is called pro-social or emotional intelligence, having, you know, regulation over your emotions and awareness of your emotions um, and scientific thinking. So, you know, finding evidence to support your uh, your thoughts uh, or something like that. Um, it really is just no different than kind of a combination of all those things. And what the goal of systems thinking is really important. We sometimes call this the systems thinking loop, which is to make sure that your mental models are in alignment with reality. And a lot of people don't even realize they have mental models. But mental models are kind of the, our thought process, the thinking that we're doing. And um, a lot of folks just sort of think that they experience the world directly, but we're actually always experience the world through what we think and, and what our mental models are. 
and we're constantly creating mental models. And the goal of systems thinking is to try to realize A, that we have mental models, B, that those mental models are really just um, kind of approximations of the reality that we're looking at. And it doesn't matter what reality that is. It could be how you're seeing your friend or how you're seeing your, your teenager or how you're seeing your work. Um, it doesn't have to be how you're seeing, you know, the, the interstellar universe or anything like that. Um, but how do we match those mental models in such a way that they get closer and closer to reality? And one way of thinking about systems thinking is it's the opposite of a thing we call confirmation bias, which is when we match reality to our mental models. Systems thinking is about matching mental models to reality. So it really is the opposite uh, of confirmation bias, which is when we have a bias that we, when we see something, we confirm the thing we already think. So we only look for the things that confirm our belief and we don't look for anything else. And it's very dangerous and it's happening all around us all the time. All of us are doing confirmation bias quite a bit. Okay, so you're going way too fast for me. Okay, so sorry. Let's just take this step by step. Yeah. So an example of a mental model is, for example, when I was young, my mom insisted that we addressed anybody who was older than us by their last name. Mm -hmm. It showed respect. Respect, yeah. So when I got into the workforce, I was calling everybody <laughs> Mr. and Miss. Now, is that a mental model that my parents had put in place so i have that as a referral yep yeah so that's a mental, mental model so mental models are something that have, has developed that you use as a referral for how you're going to behave now or in the future yeah in fact all of your behavior is based on some mental model every behavior you do is based on a mental model some of those mental models you're aware of and some of them you're not even aware of you're, you're creating them without, you know, kind of in your subconscious or they become implicit. So the commercials that we're seeing on TV, not your father's car, not your, that that's all based upon mental modeling of that's what right. you thought your father would select or your mother would select. So therefore, or a good example is this, what used to be commitment to brand. Yeah. Uh, my mother used ivory soap. My grandmother used ivory soap. I need to use ivory soap. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one form of mental models. But I mean, just pretty much everything you're experiencing is a mental model. Like, you know, uh, maybe somebody's building a, a mental model right now about our conversation and uh, what does it mean and what are they saying and all that kind of stuff. So that that too is also a mental model. It's not just things that have been passed down generation to generation or something. Ah, okay. So yeah. it's current actions or behavior, or it's current experiences. Yes, absolutely. That immediately form a mental model. Sure. You might see somebody on the bus uh, that looks angry or, you know, looks a certain way and you might build a mental model that that person's mean or that person's uh, angry or, you know, whatever. And, you know, you might not know, for example, that they just had something terrible happen in their life, or maybe they're, you know, deep in thought or, and not realizing that they're not smiling or something like that. So your mental model will determine kind of how you interact with that person. Um, and that mental model may or may not be true and often isn't. So, uh, you know, that's a great point because I remember a time I was I don't remember how it happened, but I saw this guy and he was frowning and had this angry look. And I said to him, you look so upset. What happened? <laughs> and he looked at me and he smiled and he said, I was? Oh my goodness, I didn't realize I was. And he was yeah. the nicest guy. We had this great conversation, right? But also I'm thinking like, if we see something like, I'll, you know, I might see something has a great pair of eyeglasses on. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got to figure out where to get those eyeglasses so I can look as cool as them. Right. Okay. 
So we got that. Mental. And you have a mental model of what coolness is because somebody else might not like those sunglasses. So your mental model of, of what looks cool and what is cool is different than somebody else's mental model of what looks cool and is cool. Gotcha. Okay. Confirmation bias. Yeah. Um, I have this thought and then I meet somebody else that has the same thought yeah. that's confirming my thinking. That's confirmation bias. Uh, confirmation bias is when you kind of look for only the confirmation of what your mental model is, right? So all these echo chambers that we're talking about with social media, those are all kind of confirmation bias creators. They're, they're things that reinforce only what we believe. And we don't very often venture outside of those echo, echo chambers to get information that's different than what we believe. Is that due to comfort? You're in your comfort zone? Yeah, sometimes it's about comfort zone um, and and want, you know conflict avoidance and that, you know it could be about a lot of different things. But uh, uh, right now it's actually about the the algorithm of these networks, right? Like when you like something, when you click on something in in social media land, they're gonna say, oh, this person likes that thing, so let's serve them more of things like that. So it's just literally an algorithm uh, that that we don't realize we're a part of. And every time you like or even just look at something, these algorithms of, of all these different social media companies will just give you more of that thing, which means you're seeing less of things that are unlike that thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's how echo chambers get created. Uh, and then pretty soon you think, oh, well, the whole world kind of agrees with me. <laughs> uh, have you had a chance to read Rita McGrath's book, Seeing Around Corners? I haven't, no. You, you would love it. Yeah. It, will help, it will help develop your paranoia. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading this book and I'm going, okay, all right. I'm not going on, on my internet anymore. <laughs> right. So, so then you see, I heard this for the first time the other day, that there seems to be a, a law firm that's building a class action suit against it's either Twitter or Instagram that has to do with uh, defining the behavior, the feel good, not feel good experience of yes. children who are involved the in it. The dopamine response, yeah. They're, yeah. they're actually eliciting dopamine. So how does this fit into confirmation bias or doesn't it? Uh, it, I mean, it fits in in the same way that I just said, which is uh, it, it, in that the things you like, the things uh, the, and getting likes, getting uh, clicks, getting all that stuff gives you a, an instant kind of little squirt of dopamine um, and and can become in many ways addictive, especially if you're a young mind who like a child who isn't very metacognitive or aware of their thinking and why they're doing what they're doing. And, um, and this is where, you know, I tell my own kids, you have this very powerful tool in your pocket called an, a phone. It's a very powerful tool, but it also has the power to make you a tool of it. And, and we want to be very careful of that, of that difference, right? That you use it instead of letting it use you. Okay. And a lot of these companies are, are, are whether purposeful or not, just uh, as part of the algorithms, are causing these tools to sort of use our children. So I understand that, but what I, what I don't get is, um, so if using it, assuming dopamine is used to make one happy, mm -hmm. then how do these social media echo chambers affect you in a negative way. It seems to me that if it's affecting my self-esteem, then I'm not going to tune into that. I'm going to go someplace else. So where is the addiction and where is the confirmation? But I'm, I'm getting a little confused on how that all mixes together. Yeah, it's not, it's not always about um, simply making us happy. A lot of it's about, uh, about sort of when we 
press a button and we get some kind of reaction or we get some kind of uh, some response, some kind of cause and effect. So, uh, you know, an example would be like um, uh, with the clicks, you know, you get enough clicks and and you uh, are happy, but then you compare your clicks to other kids' clicks and then you're constantly comparing yourself to other people. So you, you're getting a little bit of dopamine for each click, but you're also comparing yourself constantly based on clicks, which is a pretty superficial path to, you know, self. Uh, uh, yeah, now, yeah, I get it because I, I'm thinking back to Clubhouse and how addicted I became at right. Clubhouse. And finally I said, hey, hey, time out, stop. Right. Self, this is not this is not a good use of your time. Right? That's right. Uh, for those things to be a good use of your time, you really have to be in at the startup, right? Yeah. And then move forward. And okay. not to mention that that's also taking you away from experiencing real relationships and all kinds of other things. In the, in the case of social media, um, you know, but so you every every second that you're on, you're not paying attention to the person sitting in the room next to you and things like that. But I think you fool yourself in the fact that you actually think you have wider exposure and more in-depth exposure because That's you right. have access to people you would normally not meet. That's right. right? And, and so you get a glimpse into their eyes. Uh, and true, at the same time, you're not paying attention to the here and now. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a kind of cognitive dissonance because in one sense, we have more connections than we've ever had before. We're more connected. But in another sense, the quality of those connections has gone down. Um, and so it feels like we're more interconnected and all that kind of stuff. But in many ways, we're, the, we're, we're less connected at a quality level. And we, of course, see this when, you know, you the comment that you might get on a Twitter, if that person was standing face to face with you looking in your eyes, you, they would never say, <laughs> they would never say it the way they say it on social media because there's a human in front of you and you can like, you know, we, we have spent a lot of time together reading faces and all that kind of stuff. And when there's no face and there's no human and there's no real empathy or compassion, then you can just write it's off free, that note and say will, something, yeah. say something horrible. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now that I've got this all straight, my area is courage. Mm -hmm. And so as I mentioned before, it's really important, I feel at this time, that we learn to pat ourselves on the shoulder for a job well done in terms of having courage. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we think of ourselves as courageous in this day and age when we really need to. And so I've coined the term micro courage, mm -hmm. which really goes to daily acts of survival and recognizing that that you have been successful in those daily acts of survival and, and stopping and saying, I did good. Mm -hmm. What I wanna know is how can we use systems thinking to increase acts of courage and not macro and not micro, I'm sorry, not macro acts of courage of running into a building and saving a life. In our daily life, how can we, not that you want to sit and process everything, which I have a tendency to do, mm -hmm. um, but how can you get to courage quicker is really the question. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a, um, I've spent a lot of time, as I mentioned, in, in the, in the world of experiential learning. And one of the things that uh, that used to be kind of on the fringe, right? The outward bound and those kinds of places were focused on experiential learning. Today, it's sort of come into the mainstream and K-12 education talks about the importance of experience and that we learn from experience. And as someone that's spent their whole life, you know, in that area, um, it is it is a misnomer. It's, it's, it's incorrect to say that we learn from experience. Um, we actually don't. We we and you can just to test this idea. You can sort of think of all the people you know, 
myself included, that can do something over and over and over again and never learn, right? Never learn the thing that needs to be learned. Um, well, hold it, time out. Yeah. Is that because we, you know how women tease their husbands about selective hearing? <laughs> they hear what they want to hear and then yeah. they don't hear the rest? Yes. Yeah. So is this kind of like selective learning? Like I will choose to learn what I need to learn to survive or to be happy, quote unquote, but that learning that's unimportant, I choose not to learn it. Sometimes it. Sometimes you could say that it's selective, but in other times it's, it's affecting your life so negatively that I don't think you could say that. Um, the, the the idea is that there's something else that's needed other than just the experience itself. And it turns out that that we, we know what's needed. It's experience plus reflection. So you 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 can't just have the experience. You have to have experience and then you have to have time to reflect on that experience and the ability to sort of think through what happened and, and have an accurate depiction of what happened um what was my role in it uh positive or negative or neutral or whatever um and what can i learn from this experience and how can i move forward and 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 do something different or do more of the same or uh, not do anything at all does that reflection have to be tied to maslow's theory of completeness or happiness no, it's just it's it's really uh, that's where the connection to systems thinking and and metacognition, which is a, I know a big word, but it just means thinking about thinking, um, you know, meta and cognition. Cognition is kind of the science word for thinking, so metacognition is just thinking about thinking. So you're just thinking about your own, you know, what what was I thinking? Why did I do behave that way? Why did I react that way? Why did I? Uh, you know, or why did the other people behave or react the way they did? Um, or understanding the system itself. Uh, so that reflection is just uh, the the desire to better understand the experience. And why why do we have that desire? Well, sometimes we don't, and that's where that's where experience alone won't lead to learning. So if you have the curiosity to think about reflexively or re reflectively the the experience um, or the desire to change your behavior or change your circumstances or whatever, then um, then you'll take the time to think about that experience and and reflect. So at Outward Bound, for example, we would do very challenging activities to. Um, create stress that people could then be aware of what was going on during those periods so that they could develop the ability to be much more adaptive within those kinds of situations. And then afterward, we would sit and just, you know, we'd call it group processing, but you'd just sit around and talk about it. And from that reflection, people would learn uh, what the meaning of the experience was, what they learned from the experience, how they might do it differently next time. That type of thing. So the question then is, uh, I, I remember the popularity of Outward Bound. Um, and so you want to ask yourself, why didn't, in many cases, that experience continue to help you be more successful in other areas? So in other words, what I'm saying is, so if you look at, if you start reflecting back on jumping off of a mountain, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> With the rope tied to you. Right. <clears throat> and you remember that experience of stress and relief that you didn't kill yourself. Um, so you're reflecting back on that. Does that reflection only come into play the next time you jump off of a mountain or can it be <clears throat> used for a simple task like writing an article or? Yeah, that that's a fantastic question. And that's actually kind of at the root of why 
why sort of a, what's sometimes called adaptive training is exists to create things like grit and resilience that lead to courage. And um, the so for example, you're not, it might sound sort of strange, but it, at Outward Bound, you're not climbing a mountain for the purpose of climbing a mountain. You're climbing a mountain for the purpose of self-discovery, teamwork, uh, you know, integrity, things like that, right? Tenacity and pursuit. Um, resilience, grit, all those kinds of things. And so if you don't reflect on that, most people will go away from the experience just saying, hey, I climbed a mountain, big deal. Or, hey, I climbed a mountain and it wasn't great. Or that was a terrible experience or whatever. So if you don't have that reflective time to be like, okay, what is the meaning of that experience? What can we pull away from that experience and take it back to our regular lives? Take it back to something uh, very, you know, specific to our personal or professional lives, then that if you don't do that reflection, that learning won't happen. And it will always forever be, I went and climbed a mountain and had a terrible time. Um, and, and that's not what we want to get out of our experiences. We want to get, uh, you know, pull every literal, figurative and metaphorical, squeeze all that juice out of that experience so that we can use it in our personal and professional lives to, um, you know, better, better our lives. So I think this is really important because, um, you know, as I talk about courage, uh, and I have a whole roadmap to it. Uh, one of the, one of the pieces is, and I, I didn't have the word reflection, but one of the pieces is to sit and analyze what went wrong exactly so that you can figure out what to do next that's different that's and right so you can expect a different outcome versus doing the same thing over again not reflecting on it and saying okay how come the outcome wasn't different right that's right <laughs> well what did you reflect on and what did you put into action from that reflection right? yep yeah so it's really we think oftentimes that it, we learn from experience, but we really learn from experience plus thinking about the experience. I and, love that. And, uh, and that th those two things together are a powerful combination, but without one or the other, you know, if you don't have the experience, you don't really have much to think about. And if you don't, if you don't think about it, then you're just going to get a memory. You're just going to get a memory of the experience and you'll just say, oh, I did this then. And then this happened and it really doesn't have very much robust meaning that can be transferred to other parts of your personal and professional life. Do you feel that it's important or not this reflection process? Let's just dive into that. Mm -hmm. It's needed for really good reflection. Do you need another person? Is it something you can do yourself? <clears throat> How do you measure that the reflection that you've taken is something that's beneficial. I mean, so let's just take a look. Some people process forever and ever, and that's really yes. interesting. And, the, and it just goes on and on, on and, and on. on. Yeah. Is, is that a good outcome for reflection? I don't, I don't think so. I think, uh, again, if you think about this systems thinking loop, which is just a circle, you're, you're taking your mental model, then you're testing it in reality, then you're learning from that, and then building a better mental model and then testing it. So it's an iterative loop. So you don't want to sit back and just think and think and think and over, over think, as they say. Um, what you want to do is think a little bit and come up with a, a slightly new mental model or hypothesis or whatever. And then test it in the real world, right? So even even in the interaction that you said the guy was kind of not smiling or whatever, you, so you go, well, maybe he's maybe he's not what I think he is. So you ask a question. That's testing it in the real world, and you and then you get a response, and you go, oh, I'm going to adjust my mental model. This guy isn't grumpy or mean or whatever. He's he's uh, just in his own head and maybe not thinking about his fa facial expressions. So you're able to test it. And testing is a critical part of not overthinking, because if you go down in your basement and just think and think and think and think, you're just going to get yourself in circles. Uh, and and uh, the circle that you should be in is one with the real world, 
where you're testing against the real world. How long do we give ourselves for this reflection period? Is there a time period? I don't think it's a reflection period. It's 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 reflection testing, That's reflection it. testing. It's it's iterative. Um, it, and, and I don't really think of reflection. A lot of times when you hear the word reflection, that's why I call it thinking, uh, cause thinking is a much more active, uh, kind of thing. Thinking's happening all the time. So this isn't some contemplative media, uh, meditation kind of, uh, reflection. It's a, it's an active engaged systemic thinking about it. And, and, uh, Laura and I, in our in our research lab, what we focus on is the very specific mechanisms of how you do this thinking and how you can do it better. Um, and there's there's four basic mechanisms that drive the kinds of thinking that you're talking about. Um, and you, I got my pen. Okay. Uh, oh, you want me to go over? Okay, so yeah. uh, this it gets a, a tiny bit more technical here, but. They're just kind of the mechanisms that drive the thinking. So the first thing is we we should reflect on the, the various distinctions that we're making. So, you know, if you make the distinction that somebody's mean or somebody's angry or somebody's sad or whatever, maybe challenge that distinction by asking a question or something like that, right? So it's very basic. Uh, in other words, don't just assume that the distinctions you're making are true. Mm -hmm. get test them out in reality um for example if somebody tells you you have adhd don't just assume that that is a negative mm -hmm. right that would be a that would be a very wrong distinction and you wouldn't get all the benefits of add which are which are many fold there are some negatives but you can actually if you learn those negatives you can turn them into positives oftentimes uh I, or I dyslexia or whatever yeah dyslexia is a good one because um you know what? I'm brilliant at strategy. Yep. And, you know, so my weakness is dyslexia. My strength is strategy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so okay. that's the first one. Distinctions. That's the a D distinctions. The second one is seeing the kind of action reaction relationships between things or events. So seeing how things are related, seeing how one thing acts upon another thing and how that other thing reacts to that first thing. And, and that's all the relationships that are involved in the, in whatever you're looking at the experience or yourself or um, whatever system that you're interested in. So that's the R. Uh, so it's D it's DSRP. Those are the four things to help you remember it. DSRP. So distinctions, relationships, and then S is for um, system or sorting. And that's how how are the things configured into part whole groupings? Um, so how are things grouped? And the way things are grouped are going to determine how they behave. So that's really important. And the final one is perspective. And that's look at the thing from multiple perspectives. So don't just see your own perspective, but see others' perspectives. Uh, and that kind of thing. So it's, what are the distinctions that you're making? Let's test those. What are the relationships that you're seeing? How are things grouped, you know, into, into different groupings? And from what perspective uh, are we looking at the thing? And, they, and if you change your perspective, it might change the way things are grouped or change the way things are related or change even the way the distinctions that are being made. And so those four things, what the research shows is that those four things are really at the base of how we think about things. And we don't always know that we're thinking about them that way, but that's happening, whether we like it or not, that's happening. So it sounds like, I mean, this is very complex and, and hard to do with self. It sounds to me that you need somebody else or a team to be able to do this no um i think it's just practice right and just like anything to get good at anything it takes practice and to and anything that you can do without practice probably isn't worth getting good at so uh, <laughs> i love that one <laughs> so that practice can happen alone but obviously we're great 
humans are great at learning in social groups because we like social stuff. So obviously doing things together uh, can help, but it's not like you couldn't learn how to do it on your own. You you just, it just literally takes practice. Um, and And that's where I think adaptive training comes in in a, in any regard adapt whether you're talking about micro courage or even macro courage it's going to take adaptive training where you put yourself under some kind of stress or you want some kind of specific adaptation to a to a imposed demand so that you can get good at grit and resilience which is going to give you kind of um you know, courage or, or the kinds of, the kind of setup that makes courage possible. Mm -hmm. So the four um, principles that you gave me, are they specifically for systems thinking or uh, for reflection, experience plus reflection? How, to, what can All of the above. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're actually the way that your brain kind of organizes information and it, it's not, you, you don't really get to choose whether you organize information that way. That's the way you organize information. But the more aware we are of these processes, the better we can respond to situations and uh, with, you know, with courage or with whatever, with reflection or that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So let's take a, a really good example of and I knew I knew we we're going to run out of time, but <laughs> let, me just, let me just look at my calendar because this is just too fascinating for me. I, I love it. Um, we might have to have part two of this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yes, we'll have to have part two um, because my question becomes: What can we specifically adapt? to for courage for this. So I, what I'm gonna say here now, I want time to process what you've said to me. Yeah. And I wanna come back, I wanna invite you back for part two. Okay. I have another interview right on top of this that I made by mistake. This is fascinating because then the next part of my question is, for example, you've launched a product that was a complete failure. Yes. Then how do we use the systems thinking to gain information from that so that we can relaunch it with success? And that will be my question. Oh, good. Well, yeah. So there's a lot of things that we can talk about about that, but the, the first one would be, it's only a failure if you don't learn from it. So you're it's- You're my man. You're my man. To reflect on it. <laughs> you're my man. <laughs> <laughs> okay with that we're gonna with that will we'll end and, and go to the next one <laughs> yeah i love this hey audience this has been so exciting I, i'm just like on in seventh heaven with this conversation <laughs> um please tune in for part two of our meeting our discussion our interview with derek because it's mind-boggling and you know what, while it sounds difficult, I bet with exercise, this is really easy and it's can very unlock easy. a lot of opportunity for courage and success. That's right. So with that, Derek, thank you. I'm gonna be sending you a note now, as soon as my next interview is over for part two. Okay, and thanks CB. I hope the better half will, will join us. But Yeah, no, she We'll get the 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 smarter half of of our our of our group, uh, Laura, who works with me, and we're also married on our well, research. If not, we'll do part three with Laura and again. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I can't wait to part two of this. I'm super excited. Oh, Thank great! Thank you so much, and okay. audience. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye for now.